My name is Avrami Zippel. I'm a rabbi here in Salt Lake City, Utah. I am 28 years old, and I was sexually abused by my nanny for a decade. I realized that it never gets easier. There's The words, I was sexually abused as a child, never roll off your tongue. If I'm going to acknowledge that something terrible has been done to me, which I was not party to, which I was not complicit in, what kind of God lets that happen? I was raised in a sheltered household. You know, we were the household that we didn't watch movies if there was a kissing scene. That was kind of our exposure to the outside world, and and I, I, I don't look back on that disparagingly. It was a childhood that was dominated by the theme of service and, and, and giving to a community and caring for others and putting others' spiritual needs uh, above one's physical needs. In the summer of 1999, uh, my parents just moved into a new house. We moved right before my birthday. Uh, my eighth birthday party was kind of like a housewarming little gig, and my parents had just started getting regular full-time help. More than anything, I remember just confusion. I knew without a doubt that that was not okay, but the confusion that resulted from that was who's not okay? Who's wrong here? Who's guilty? I think there were too many questions for my eight-year-old mind to handle, and so I decided to take the path of less resistance, and I just decided to do nothing about it and just leave things the way they were. I assumed that my confusion and my silence, you know, on an eight-year-old's level, gave my abuser the answer she was looking for as to, you know, how this situation could possibly progress. And it did. I never fought. I never resisted. I never screamed. And I remember multiple times leaving the bathroom and I'd start reciting the Hebrew confessional prayer. And while, whilst I was doing that, I was wondering when this would happen again. I don't know how an adult can live with, 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 with those you know, competing voices in their head. I don't know how a child lives with those competing voices in their head. What I remember quite clearly is that I was completely unaware that what had been going on was referred to as sexual abuse. In my mind, sexual abuse uh, required a very important component, and that was that it required coercion. You know, I was making every effort from, from the outside perspective to live, you know, the, the best version of my life. And I was a happy kid, and I was, uh, you know, successful in my studies, and I still wanted to be a rabbi, and there were times that I would go to bed at night, and before I would do that, I'd look in the mirror, and I was convinced that the person that I saw in the mirror was the most despicable person in the entire world. I don't know, where, where do they send sinners? You know, where, where, whatever they do with, you know, the worst of mankind, that's what they were going to do with me. As the years went along, I got married, which for me uh, had been the hope that uh, that would be healing. You know, here was going to be um, the first healthy, proper, appropriate sexual relationship in my life. Bear in mind that before I got married, I had never as much as held hands with another woman, you know, the exception of my abuser. Getting married wasn't the magic potion. Shortly after my wife and I had our first child, I was not myself. I was, you know, dealing with symptoms of depression and anxiety and the stuff in my head wasn't just going away, and it wasn't just being put to bed quietly at night. It was demanding answers. In February of 2016, uh, my parents and my wife sat me down, and they said, you're not, you're not you. Um, we think you should go and see somebody. And I was very resistant. It was, you know, the prototypical therapist's office with the couch and the bookcase and his little thermos of coffee. And 
He looked at me and says, you know, so what, what brings you here today? And he was the first human being that I ever said the words to. And I looked up at him and I said, I think I was sexually abused by my nanny. In the months that I started seeing my therapist, I think that there was kind of this natural progression from, okay, this was wrong. This is not your fault. Not only was this, was this not your fault, but th this is actually a crime. Pursuing the criminal element of it would mean publicly acknowledging that I had been sexually abused. And that was a non-starter. That was not going to happen. In January of 2018, um, Larry Nasser was brought to justice and all of his survivors testified in open court on TV and I watched Ali Reisman's testimony. And Ali was a Jewish girl and, and, and this, this you know world record setting gymnast and here she was telling the story. You know, if a gold medal gymnast can be a survivor of sexual abuse, why can't a rabbi? On January 30th, 2018, I called the cops. And I remember walking out of the police station and I called my wife and I said, if I die today, I will die a happy man. She will know that this behavior did not go unnoticed. My abuser was arrested on 130 counts of sexual abuse. I didn't know what to expect on any level. And seeing, you know, my abuser's mugshot, you know, under this headline, 130 counts, 130 counts, for the first time it really set in that a crime had been done to me. I testified on Tuesday, February 5th, and later that day my story was published. I was a survivor of sexual abuse for the whole world to know. For so many different reasons, it was the most healing thing I could have ever done. When I started healing, I think for me that was probably the biggest question, is if I'm not so terrible, where does that put me with God? What I can say is that having been on this journey with everything that it has entailed, leaves not a shadow of a doubt in my mind that this journey is divinely inspired. I could not be more thankful or grateful or appreciative to God for having given me the ability to see his hand guiding me down this path. Wow, well, what well, uh, good? Yeah. Avrami, incredible. Thank you. Uh, your heroism, your strength, and welcome to Chabad Westport. It's very, very tough after such footage to jump in with small talk. So we won't jump in with any small talk, just jump straight in. And, you know, I want to thank you for your openness 
And, you know, and as we discussed a couple of minutes before we let, let everyone in, I said, you know, is there any questions or any topics which are off, uh, you know, off limits? And Avremi was very open. He said, there's nothing that's off limits. So tonight I'm going to ask a couple of questions and lead a little bit of a discussion over here together with Avremi. And then we'll also open it up for questions. So if you have a question, uh, the best way to do it is to type it into, type it in, text it, and we'll make sure that it's addressed to the best of the ability. So Avrami, at the end of the clip, you know, the uh, wording over there is after the verdict, Avrami and his, and his family returned home to welcome Shabbat. And there you are walking into the sunset as if sort of like it's all behind you. But you never really can leave an ordeal like this behind you. Um, I'm just wondering, how does it affect you daily and what do you do about it? Well, thank you for the introduction and, and, and for hosting me tonight, Rabbi Kant. One second, one second, I think. Oh, 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 go for it. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and for hosting this conversation with our community. Um, when I think about that, that topic of, you know, how does one kind of move on into the sunset from experiences like these, I'm always reminded of a conversation that I had with my therapist the very first time that I was in therapy. Uh, as, I, as I referenced in the video, I wasn't particularly excited to be there, but I went, I wasn't given much of a choice by those that love me in life. And we had a, we had a productive conversation. I had to give him that. It wasn't as disastrous as I had uh, feared. And at the end of the conversation, I looked up at him, I said, you know, doctor, you know that I was not excited to come see you today. And I have to say it wasn't so bad. So I just want to know from you, how many more times do you plan on seeing me? Or how many more, how many more times should I plan on seeing you? And the insinuation of my question was, was a pretty straightforward one. Actually, just a couple of years before this therapy appointment, I had broken my leg, a sports injury. And I had an appointment with an orthopedist and I had surgery and I had physical therapy and I, you know, they put me back together good as new. And my, my surgeon was a wonderful, wonderful man. I think I saw him twice before the surgery and maybe twice after the surgery. And then we all went our separate ways in life. He's a great guy, but I had no intention of making him a regular part of my life. And so I, I asked my therapist the question with the same tone of, uh, you know, what's, what's going to be the, the nature of our relationship? I'll see you a couple more times. You'll give me a book to read. You know, I'll check in with you every year. What's, uh, where are we headed? So he looks back at me and he smiles and he says, I'll tell you what, why don't you come back next week and we'll take it from there. And I think that, you know, what, what he wasn't saying in so many words is I'm not going to be your orthopedic surgeon. You know, I'm not going to see you three, four, five, six, a dozen times, and then we'll each part as friends. This is going to be a, a lifetime of coming back from this. And I think that for survivors of childhood trauma, I think it's probably the most difficult and the most overwhelming part to wrap your mind around is that this is going to be a lifetime journey. You know, there's going to be ups and there's going to be downs and there's going to be times where it's more pervasive and less pervasive, but this is not really something that you ever graduate from. This is not really something to, to borrow that reference that you ever get to walk into the sunset and be done with it. This is something which will be a reality that you grapple with forever. And I, and I know that forever sounds like a scary word, but it is, it is the reality. And so I think dealing with those experiences and dealing with the reaction to those experiences and finding a way how that fits into your life and coping with that is a, a regular continuous daily journey. And I think that accepting that and being mindful of that is in and of itself such a large part of recovery and finding a way to, to make that part of one's daily routine, that itself is really the victory. Yeah. And, you know, as I mean, as a Chabad rabbi, so I think we uh, share a lot in common, uh, you know, on, in communities, and we share a mission inspired by the same words of uh, the Rebbe. And so I'm, as I'm watching this, I'm still watching the video, and it's almost like I'm reading a book. It's unfolding in front of my eyes, and I'm screaming inside, like, this is not fair. This is just not fair, you know, an eight-year-old being preyed upon and sexually abused, and I, it's just too, too enormous. For, for my mind as an adult, and I was, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it, and yet it's a reality. This is your life. So it's a reality in your life. Um, is that an emotion perhaps that you shared? Like, did you ever ask the question, why me? I did. <laughs> you know, to your point about Rabbi Cantor, about sharing a mission and sharing a purpose, I, I, 
always love when we have one of these conversations and, and specifically when I have it with a fellow shliach, a fellow rabbi, and the topic of faith comes up. I think a lot of people expect that the direction of the conversation will go in is that, you know, what Rabbi Cantor will ask me, you know, was it difficult for you? And I'll say no, because I believed in God and I had the Rebbe and I had Chassidus on my side and everything was wonderful and it was easy. Uh, and, and, and the reality is it's, it's not, not quite, not, not quite exactly the truth. I like to put it to people that as I look back on it, God and I have had a pretty complicated relationship over the years. And, and as I think about it, there's really kind of been three phases, one might say, to that relationship. For, for a very large part of my life, for the better part of my life, I, I lived in a mindset where I was pretty convinced that God hated me. I, I know that sounds very simplistic, almost a little childish. I think it's important to realize that this was a mindset that was developed when I was a, a child. And so it, it being a childish reality almost kind of fits. I spent the better part of my life not understanding the nature of what was happening to me, not understanding that it wasn't my fault, that it was abuse, it was a crime and so on. And so if I didn't have that frame of reference to fall back on, I was quite convinced that it was my fault. And if it was my fault, if I was somehow participatory and immoral, wrong behavior, there was good justification for the almighty God to hate me. And I thought that God hated me. I was pretty convinced for a very long time that God hated me. And I got to tell you that believing that God hates you is a, is a somewhat lonely place to be in, to, to kind of go through life being in that mindset. I would later discover that there's actually a more painful place to live in. There's a more painful mindset to be in than believing than, that God hates you. And that is believing that somehow God has ignored you. And I would say that that you know, phase of the relationship came up really once I started therapy and when I began to realize that you know, this wasn't my actions and my participation, this was a crime that had been done over here. I think, it, you know, to your question, Rabbi Cantor, I think it really began to set in, you know, how, how does that happen? You know, the God that, that we learn about and, and more that we learn about, the God that we sell to people, the God that we preach to people, you know, the God of Chassidus, the all-knowing, all-seeing, all-encompassing, all-powerful God, how does he let children get hurt? not once or twice or 10 times, but repeatedly over and over during the years, where does he go when these things happen? Did, did my file miss his desk? Was he out sick that day? Did, did, he, did he somehow you know, pass over this information? It's a dark place to be in and, and, and to ask yourself, why me? And, 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 and where, where, where was everyone? And, and by everyone, I mean specifically God that was supposed to be involved in, in somehow preventing this. And I think you come to realize that those are questions that you'll never really get a satisfactory answer to. I think the question of why me, which is a valid question and a good question, is I don't think there's been a single person alive who's asked that question and gotten a good answer for that question. I think in that sense, when you go through something that leads you to ask why me, you sign yourself up to join the list of, of, of the hundreds of thousands throughout the ages who have endured pain and suffering. I think that the one good piece of news and as we move into the third phase of the relationship between me and the almighty is that I, I think I've been fortunate enough to be in a place where I've been able to see the good that can come about through my experiences and why that good has to come about specifically through suffering it's a good question and again one that will have to leave us a question but I, I think that when people ask the question why me people get stuck on the why part you know, why, why, why is all this happening to me? And I think that Chassidus teaches us that instead of asking why me and focusing on the why part, we have to focus on the me part. You know, why is this happening specifically to me? Is there some good in the world that I am positioned to bring about because of my unique position? And that's why these things happen to me. And I think if you can get to a place where you can begin to understand that and you can begin to process that and you can live in that headspace, it gives you the ability to find some purpose for the experiences that you went through. And I think that purpose and that positivity that you can bring to the world around you really is so crucially part of the healing. So I have to say, I, I was a little nervous that you were going to forget about the third phase. And then they would be asking me the question and I would have all the inadequate answers to that question. So I'm glad that you uh, you moved to the third phase, but I'm even more glad or actually more inspired that you have found that for the third phase, uh, found that that faith and found that strength. And, you know, again, that itself is a tremendous 
tremendous inspiration. And maybe later on we can talk about where actually that, that comes from. But I, I don't want to move on a little bit in the in the story because it's sort of like itching to get more details of the story and how you worked through it. Um, and maybe this is not a fair question, but as a parent and as a grandparent, I think to myself, I scream inside and I ask myself, could this have been avoided? And I don't know if it's a fair question to you, but uh, throwing it out to you. First of all, I think the fact that you're a parent and a grandparent, you're, you're owed a Mazel Tov. My sources off camera told me, I think the grandparent license just got renewed to Mazel Tov to you and to the cements for, for that milestone in life. It's a very fair question. And I think for me, it's the reason why it's so particularly fair is because when I came out, I was a parent. And when I came out and seeing the video at that point, I had a I had a four-year-old, now he's almost a seven-year-old. And so, you know, for me, as my son gets to the age where, where he's almost at the same place in time where I began to go through these things, I think about it a lot. You know, I, I can talk about these things until I'm blue in the face, but as a parent, what can I do differently? Are these things avoidable? Are these things preventable? In fact, when I, whenever I talk on the topic, it's my favorite question to get, you know, Rabbi, what can I do to be certain that these things will never happen to my child? But, you know, I don't think it would be surprising for you to know. I get the question on a pretty regular basis. And I share with parents that there's really only one thing, one thing that you can do if you want to guarantee that your children will never be preyed upon by somebody who wishes to do them harm. Take your kids, wrap them in bubble wrap and lock them in a closet in your house. If you do that, then you can be certain that they will never ever cross paths with somebody who seeks to do them harm. The minute your child walks out the door of your home as a parent, as, as, as an educator, as whomever we are, as someone who cares passionately about children, to be honest, there's really nothing that we can do to absolutely ascertain and guarantee that our children will never cross paths with someone who seeks to do them harm. I often tell the story before I went totally public, I began to tell people who were close to me, people who I didn't want them reading about this on Facebook for the first time, I wanted them to hear it from me. And one of those people is a cousin of mine, serves as a Chabad rabbi on a college campus in the Northeast. And I, we, we grew up together, we're three months apart. And I told him the story. This was before the whole world knew. And it was a lot for him to hear. And he's processing on the phone and you know, he hangs up and he calls me back about 15 minutes later. And he says, I just want to let you know, I was so devastated by what you shared. My wife and I are on a college campus and we're very, very busy as one might expect. And we have a number of people here on campus who care for our kids when we're occupied. And I went and I shared with my wife what had happened with your babysitter. And just because we're so shook up about what happened between you and your babysitter, my wife and I called every single caregiver that cares for our children on a regular basis and fired them all on the phone. Sight on scene, got rid of all of them at once, just a wholesale cleansing. I appreciated the gesture in the moment, but the reality is that, you know, if we were to, 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 to cut off access from our children to everybody in the world that has ever done harm to kids, be it coaches, parents, doctors, religious leaders, family, who, you know, the list goes on and on, our, our children wouldn't have a whole lot of people to, to talk to or to hang out with. The reality is that as parents, grandparents, educators, whomever we are, there's, there's absolutely one thing that we can do in this space. And that is that we can make sure that our children live in a world where there is a mindset in their house, in their environment, in their space, that any topic, any topic that they should want to discuss with us as parents, even if it's a topic that in their own perception, discussing it with us, bringing it up to us, might cause them shame, shame and embarrassment and disappointment is not something they will ever receive from us as parents. I think a lot of people think that children who go through these sorts of experiences usually end up quiet because they're trying to protect the adult in, in this dynamic. They're trying to protect their abuser. And I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that more often than not, the reason why kids don't speak up in these sorts of environments is because they're trying to protect themselves. There's a concern that if anybody were to find out about this, the shame that the child would have to carry, the, the, the embarrassment they would suffer at the hands of their parents would be far too much to bear. And so I think as parents, the responsibility is to give our children the knowledge, to give them the tools to know that there should never, ever be any sort of topic that they might be embarrassed from discussing with us out of concern that they don't know how we'll react or we might get upset or, or whatever it may be. By sharing that reality with our children, we give them the tools to speak up in any and every situation. 
Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's a great advice. I mean, easier said than done, of course. It sure uh, is. You can't just tell your children, feel free to discuss anything with me because it's that block that they have inside that they themselves don't know why they have that block or it's shame. So, I mean, that's a natural pivot to, um, well, to two points. Number one is I, I think it's incredible that uh, you yourself have gotten yourself past the stage where you know, you're not shielding your children as a result of that, um, hovering and being a helicopter parent, recognizing that specifically you have to give them other empowerments uh, in order to, to be able to not be so susceptible, but at the same time, you know, having come from it yourself, I mean, I think it's incredible that you're able to, to move on and give them that rope. But, you know, the natural question would then be, uh, how did your parents deal with it? And, I, you know, I know your parents somewhat from a distance and iconic uh, shluchim in uh, Salt Lake City, uh, Utah. And how did they deal with it? You know, uh, just to circle back to, to, to the other question, uh, people think that, you know, you go through this and you're going to you're going to helicopter parent as a result of it. The abuse happened in my home, in my parents' home, I should say. The abuse happened 95% of the time when one of my parents was present in the home. I think that my story should go a long way to educate people that e even helicopter parents can't really prevent a lot of this from happening by virtue of their helicoptering. Um, I, I think it's just, it's an important point to, uh, to note. Uh, did we lose power in Westport? Uh-oh. Oh, no. you told me there was a storm you told me there was a storm on the way um how did my parents react you know i i often tell people that i waited for a few weeks after being in therapy to share this to disclose this disclose this with my parents because i wanted to be in a place that when i shared it with them i wouldn't come across as making them feel ashamed for what had happened that was definitely not my intention i firmly believe, as I have believed from the beginning of this process, that there was absolutely nothing, and I, and I mean that with real certainty, absolutely nothing that my parents could have done or not done that would have prevented any of this from happening. And I wanted to convey that to them when I would share this information with them. I think as, as human beings as a whole, and, and specifically as Jews, we can all relate to the fact that guilt is often something which is felt even in irrational situations, even when we're told, oh, don't feel guilty about this, yet somehow miraculously, we still feel guilty. And for my parents, I think it, that was really the journey they would have to go on in, in coming to grips with this is, is figuring out what to do with that guilt that they inevitably felt. My parents felt feel very guilty for what happened. I, I think they don't have to. I think they shouldn't on a certain level. Yet they do. And I think it reinforces that when someone goes through these sorts of experiences, the, the healing process and the journey of recovery is, is something which needs to be embraced by everybody in their circle. It, it was one thing for me. It was another thing for my parents. It was a completely different thing altogether for my wife, for my siblings, for everyone who was somehow affected by this story, by this issue at any level. It was so vital for them to go down their own road of recovery and to engage in their own healing process and to take the time and space that was needed to do that properly. And, and I think that remains a continuous journey, just as much as it remains a journey for me, it remains a journey for them, and it remains a journey for all involved. It's, you know, I, I can't begin to imagine what it's like to, to get that news as a parent that your, your child went through that. And it's it's a lot, and it's and it's their, you know, their lifetime process of, of, of dealing with that, and, and everyone deals with it in their own way. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, so, your reaction when um, when you went to see a therapist and just in general, you, you were very resistant, understandably so, to go public with the story. It must have taken tremendous courage to go public, uh, which also meant, you know, going to trial, everything was going to be public. And uh, there was something which, you know, which um, something that clicked at some point. And I don't know, we said in the video, it said that it was like when uh, Ali Reisman was testifying. Um, what exactly about that was the catalyst for you that empowered you to go out there? When I first contemplated reporting to law enforcement, and then once I reported to law enforcement, I shared with everybody that was remotely associated with the case that I had one very, very specific 
request, demand, stipulation, whatever you want to call it. This was never to become public. Why? Because if it would, I knew that inevitably for me, that meant that my, my lifetime claim to fame, as it were, would be, I would be Zippel, the guy who was sexually abused, be that in, you know, the wider Chabad community or even here locally. And I wasn't, I wasn't interested in that title. Uh, you know, as I tell people, I, I'm a Chabad rabbi in Salt Lake City, Utah. People stare at me enough when I walk in the street. I wasn't looking for more, you know, uh, eyeballs attached to the story. And so that was, that was, you know, my demand, my, my, my desire. I came to understand something throughout this process, and that is that the person who was most uncomfortable with me being known as, as Zippel, the guy who was sexually abused, really to me, the, the opinion of this one and that one and the other one and all the different human beings in my universe were, were not as important to me as my own opinion of myself. I was uncomfortable with that being my reality. I still wasn't in a place where I could accept myself for that. And I needed to, to grow from that. I needed to heal from that. And, you know, yes, into 2018, there was the whole USA Gymnastics story. And that was profoundly inspiring, watching, you know, hundreds of young women be comfortable to step into their own skin, be comfortable with their own experiences. And there was one night when the decision was really weighing on me pretty, pretty prominently. And I decided I, I needed to speak to somebody. I needed to pick the brains of somebody who had been through this. So I sat down in my living room in front of my laptop and I Googled. Uh, male Orthodox Jewish survivor of sexual abuse. I figured that, you know, Google probably knows of, I don't know, a couple of these people and they can provide me some sort of contact info. And the search pretty much came up empty. Google didn't know of anybody who fit that title. And, you know, Google usually has a pretty good way of knowing if, if there's information out there. And I remember, you know, that reality kind of coming crashing down around me that nobody else had really gone down this path. And it was, it was kind of a double-edged sword. Part of it was very depressing, saddening, that there was no one else to talk to who had really been through this. But part of it was really empowering. And going back to the question of why me, it really set in the reality of, you know, maybe the reason why I've been put into this situation is because the same way I wish that there was somebody out there, excuse me, that could talk to me, Maybe I was put into the situation to be that person for somebody else. And so instead of beating myself up and getting all down in the dumps that there's no one to talk to, I'm here to be the someone to talk to for somebody else. And so for me, that was really kind of that, that ability to see the situation differently. And, and that's, you know, my, my, my worst fears were actualized. I became as if the guy who was sexually abused. And I came to realize that if I was okay with that, anybody else's perception of that, of that reality was was worthless to me. So long as I was comfortable with that, everybody else was welcome to uh, to take a number. Which is the uh, sort of like an astonishing moment uh, that the watershed moment for you was that there was no one else out there that you could turn to. And then in typical Chabad style, you you know you twisted it and you said, well, if there's no one for me to turn to, that means there's no one for someone else to turn to. So therefore, I'm going to be that guy that people can turn to. I mean, that's a real. The real Chabad Lubavitch sort of. Uh, I would agree. One might say it sounds a little backwards, but you know, I think it's uh, for 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 folks like us, it's I think it's part of our DNA. It's the way you know, the Rebbe taught us to see situations in the world, to see voids in the world, and 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 yeah, you see a void and you step into it. And it's incredible. Obviously, I don't want to be the one philosophizing, but it's incredible because it's been good for you to come forth, and it's been therapeutic and it's been healing and all that. I mean, I can't even say those words because it's your journey. But so it's that concept of seeing yourself to help someone and yet sometimes you're helping yourself the most. I would agree. You know, you know I really wanted to stop over here and just say, maybe you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing in Salt Lake City. Yeah, how the Chabad is over there. Everyone on is very familiar with Chabad of Westport. We've been growing together as a community for the last, uh, you know, two, you know, two decades, two and a half decades. So it would be really nice to sort of like connect with you um, and your Chabad house of Salt Lake City, but I, I can't uh, I can't do that right now because I have a burning question, which is at least it's burning for me, and that is, so you had this all like deep down in your um, subconscious, you were squashing it. It was like part of your history, but it wasn't exactly. And so I have, I guess, three part question. But the first thing is, what gave you the strength to power on from say sixteen to twenty three? So when you start to understand about sexuality, you know, when you're eight years old, what do you understand? But you're getting a little older and you 
you can be sheltered from day to tomorrow, but you know, you're gonna understand sexuality. So whether it's 16 or 18 or whatever, whatever age it is, till the time that you got married, what was what kept you going? What gave you the strength? I think it's a great question, and it's a question which is not asked enough because I think it really gives the ability for a powerful reality to, to come forward. I drowned my issues in Judaism. I think that we live in a world where people drown their issues in alcohol, they drown their issues in other substances, they drown their issues in other dangerous behaviors. I drowned my issues in pages of Talmud. I drowned my issues in, 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 in my marim of chassidus. I drowned my issues in Judaism. And, and, and for me, I think it's an important point to make because I think it's, it's, it's a really misunderstood part of the whole conversation. I, I always share this story whenever I can, because to me, it was such an inspiring moment in a very weird way. When, after I had gone to the police and the case had been opened long before it had ever crossed my mind to speak publicly on the topic in any form or fashion, I felt like I needed to be honest with one person. There was one mashpia, one teacher I had in yeshiva, who I was immensely close with throughout the years. And, and he was the person I had come this close to telling if there was one human being alive. And I, and I figured it, it had been eating at me for years that I hadn't been honest with him. And if I was gonna tell somebody, I was gonna tell him. And so one evening I worked up the courage and I picked up the phone and I called him up and I told him everything. The words just tumbled out and it's quiet, a good 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, he, he says on the other end of the line, he says, wow, this was not the conversation I ever expected to have with you. And he went on to, to, to elaborate. He meant that as a compliment. You know, inevitably, it's, it's possible that at some point he's going to have students who were sexually abused. Who is he going to have that conversation with? The students that, you know, were struggling in life and the students that couldn't make it, the students that were, you know, weren't really cutting it. And at some point he's going to sit down with them and say, you know, well, gosh, why, why is life so challenging for you? And they'd say, look, Rabbi, what do you want from me? I'm a survivor of sexual abuse. And he'd say, ah, you're a survivor of sexual abuse. Okay. So that's why you're struggling. But to have the conversation with someone who didn't think I'd struggle academically and was, you know, to use the, the, the our parlance and Yeshiva was a good boy was not, was not something he had ever anticipated. And I think that that's such a misunderstood part of our, of our society is that we expect people who, who have been through these sorts of experiences is to look a certain way, to act a certain way, to struggle a certain way. And to, I think that part of breaking that stigma and sharing that, you know, people who aren't outwardly struggling are, are really deeply struggling and are choosing to numb their pains in, in, in other forms and fashions is vitally important as we really try to tackle, you know, this sort of issue on a larger basis. So you you drowned it um, with study and you... you uh delved deeper and um, dived into sort of like uh, more of the religious slash study sort of life. Yeah. And then it was time to get married. And was that a hurdle? I mean, um, yes. I mean, looking back for me, it was going to be the cure. I, I marriage was going to be this kind of this, this, this cleansing moment. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, in, in, in Chassidus, we talk, you know, in, in, throughout Torah thought, we talk about the fact that a bride and a groom on the day of their wedding, it's like a personal Yom Kippur, and they're granted absolution for all of their sins, and they have the ability to, to turn over a new leaf. I was really, really interested in, in taking that as literally as possible. And for me, you know, I looked forward to, to getting married and, um, you know, that just being the moment where, where all the pain from my past would just go up in smoke. And it would pop, it would be gone. I was married, it was turning over a new life. I was having, a, like I mentioned in the video, a healthy sexual relationship for the first time. And, and it was magic, it was gonna be a magical potion. And, and as it turns out, not only was it not a magical potion, but when someone who has been through these sorts of experiences enters into an intimate relationship, it is a hurdle. It's a very, very daunting hurdle. And so, you know, ultimately I think that getting married really was a large part of pushing those issues to the fore to the point that they, you know, did boil over and required required to be addressed. But yeah, for me, in my mind, looking back then when I was in that place, marriage was going to be the, the cure to everything. It was going to be the, 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 the one thing that would put an end to all the pain and suffering and, and move on in the clear. And then you had your first child and things went to pot, or I guess must have a little 
it became more, it boiled, you know, to the surface and your parents and your wife sat down with you and said, this is, you've got to see someone professional. And the trigger there was? The trigger there was, and, you know, I'm not sure if the cements just had their first or their second or their ninth or their 12th, but, you know, there, there's a moment where every, every new parent, second, okay, so Amanda, you're only an old hand at this conversation. There's a moment as a father, I, I can't speak for all of humanity, but as a father, I think, I think a lot of fathers look forward to this. There's a moment where you hold your first child in your hands for the first time. And, and there's a moment where you, you make eye contact with your child. Usually when you make this eye contact, you know, your, your, your baby's not you know, deeply gazing into your eyes and going to say something profound. They're usually you know, shrieking at that moment. But there's a moment where you feel like a father, where you feel like you are this child's parent, you are this child's caregiver. You will be the, the, the adult that they look to who walks on water. You will be the one who hung the moon in the sky. You will be the greatest adult in the world in the eyes of this child. And I remember in that, that moment making eye contact with my shrieking five minute old son and, and, and feeling that connection that the level of self-loathing and the level of shame that I felt in that moment, thinking that I would never be that adult for this child was a breaking point. You know, the, the, the amount of shame that I was carrying to that moment made it impossible for me to feel like I was ever going to be the father and the parent and the adult that this child deserved. And it, and it was unfair. It was unfair almost that every baby that was being born in the maternity wing of that hospital was going to have the greatest father in the world. And this kid wasn't. And, and I think that that was that pushed me over the edge. And, and you know, I was in therapy seven months after that. And so, you know, it, it is always interesting to look back and see specifically what the triggers are and and how that happened and why that happens. But for me, I look back on that moment and I think that it was profoundly impactful. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, quite emotional over there to hear you say that. And obviously, I mean, the obvious question is how, how it, it takes tremendous courage for you, uh, but it's a family healing. So it takes tremendous courage from your wife. How was she in this whole journey? A few years ago, this point, there was someone we had for, for a Shabbat dinner at our home. And the conversation came up about my wife learning of all this. And someone asked my wife, and I think it's best to put it in her words, not mine, you know, how surprising, for lack of a better term, was this for you? And my wife shared with the guests that we got married, I was 22, my wife was 21. If I had shared with her in 2016, that in the 22 years before she knew me, I had been a very accomplished astronaut and taken multiple missions to outer space, that would have been more believable or more plausible or more likely than what I actually shared with her. You know, my wife came from a headspace much, much like I did, where th this is just not, it's not on the list of things that we go through in our community. No one will ever, you'll never, you'll never marry a guy who will ever talk to you about this because this just doesn't happen to people in our community. And, to, and, and for her to learn that this had been not just a part of my past, you know, once or twice, but, but that prominently part of my past was earth shattering, was devastating beyond belief, was just, it, it turned everything on its head. And as I mentioned earlier, in, in the context of my parents, it, it, it's a healing journey for them. It's a profound healing journey for my wife. And I am immensely grateful that, you know, she has made the choice to, to allow me to, to, to go through with this and not just to kind of, you know, do it in a passive role, but to be supportive in her own right and to be an inspiration in the female community in her own right. And, and I think we've both learned that being there for others really is the greatest way of bringing healing to oneself. And it's really all you can really aspire to do in life. And, and I'm grateful that she's chosen to take that journey alongside me. Wow. Yeah. Truly courageous. So, so <laughs> Avrami, I have other things and other questions, and I know there's been some questions have been posted, but I, you know, I do want to, we've, we've gotten to know you in the last uh, 45 minutes for your story, but I'd love to hear about your life and the Chabad that's going on in uh, Salt Lake City. I know that people are probably saying, why am I pivoting to that? But I you know there's a very humanistic aspect over here, and we're talking to, you know, talking to a brother. And I, I appreciate it. Sure. My parents started Chabad here in Utah almost 30 years ago. And next summer will be 30 years. I was raised on the job. Um, I'm, I'm the oldest of six. My parents moved to Utah. I was a little baby. 
And I think, uh, like um, you can very well attest to Rabbi Cantor, some kids, uh, some shluchim raise their kids in, in, in communities and the kids grow up and whether it's in Salt Lake City, Utah or in Westport, Connecticut, and they think to themselves, okay, this was cool. This was fun. I want nothing to do with this when I grow up. And, and some kids come back, you know, come back to join the family business. For me, uh, you know, being a, a, a shliach myself, being a rabbi myself was something which had always appealed to me from a very, 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 very young age. I think that as we talk about the prototypical, you know, shliach's kid, you know, the junior rabbi in the synagogue at age six and all that, that was, that was me undeniably. Um, and after my wife and I got married, that, that, that opportunity presented itself. Um, Salt Lake City is a rapidly growing community, uh, specifically in the younger demographic. And so one of the uh, projects that my wife and I were, were tasked with was to develop the younger part of the community. Um, kids, teens, young adults, we're actually very fortunate that one of the uh, founders of, of the Young Professional Initiative that we started in Salt Lake City is actually on Zoom tonight. We've, Rebecca Cantor, we've sent you our best. Kara is now in, in your part of the world. Uh, she was at our first Young Professional event ever and was a large part in, 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 in making it grow from that moment forward. But it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing to come back to the community that you were born in and to help develop it and to watch it grow and to really kind of bring about its it's, it's next wave of, of, of young families and young professionals. We've started a preschool, we've started a day school, thank God. Um, and, and, and the reality is, I think that, you know, kind of tying it back to, to, the, to the reason we're here, I think that my experiences have, have made me in a certain sense a better shliach. They've made me a better rabbi. I know that before I came forward, the thought process that was most central to me was not how, you know, Chabad on a global level, was going to react it was how are the people in my shul going to react how are the people who i interact with on a daily basis going to react their their reaction was far more important to me than anybody else and uh, you know it's been my community that has shown me love and support and encouragement and you know being the greatest possible cheerleaders along this journey and i think that you know vice versa i think going down this road has given me the ability to to be a better rabbi, to be a better, a better human being, but, but you know, to, in a leadership role, to, to have a unique perspective of people suffering and to be there you know, in that with them and, and to listen better and to try to understand better and to empathize better. It's something which has definitely impacted the way I go about my work. And you know, one of the things which has been incredible just reading and listening to some of your prior talks uh, is the fact that um, you actually got up on by sentencing, I believe it was. And you told your abuser, I forgive you. And I mean, I can't get my head around that. Um, I, I almost say, why would you do that? Right. You know, it's interesting. You, I know that you and I are both teaching uh, uh, an adult education course, the same course, um, uh, Overcoming Antisemitism. And last night, I, I taught the first lesson of the course. And in, in conversation, we talked a lot. There, there's an expression uh, in, the, in the text of, of lesson one of the course. I don't mean to put a spoiler. I'm not sure if you've already taught lesson one or, or not yet, but oh well, well, I hate to I'll I'll try to keep this as minimal as possible. There's a, there's a, there's a text in there about, you know, we live in a world where being perennial victims is almost celebrated. I, the way I like to think about it is, you know, if I wanted, if I wanted to make the choice to live a life of resentment towards my abuser on a on a regular basis, I don't think there's a human being alive that could stop me from doing that, that could somehow share with me that I wasn't entitled to that resentment. I, I'm the victim of a crime and that's a distinction that I'll wear forever. And if I wanted to wake up every single morning raging and yelling and screaming and just you know channeling all that negative energy towards my abuser, I would be so entitled. I, I don't think anybody could tell me that that's not fair. The problem is that if I were to do that, if I were to make that choice, there would only be one person in the world who would really be suffering from all of that resentment, and that wouldn't be my abuser. She's far away, somewhere else. The only person that would have to deal with all that resentment would be me. I'd be the only one who would be holding all of that inside. And so at, before sentencing, when I you know, wanted to decide what I wanted to say to the court and to her and to everyone who was present, I wanted to make it perfectly clear to everybody, but most importantly to myself, that I was making the choice to not allow that resentment to fuel me and guide me on a regular basis because I, I want no part of that in my life. I could if I wanted to, sure, but I'm not interested. And, 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 I, and I think what I learned is that forgiveness is a much greater 
is of much greater benefit to the one giving it than the one receiving it. I think we like to think that when we forgive somebody, we've somehow enhanced their lives. And I think we very often tend to forget that when we forgive somebody, really more than anything, we've enhanced our own life. We've given ourselves the ability and, and almost the permission to live a life free of resentment and negativity and hatred and, and all that sort of energy. And so for me, it was, it was crucial to say that. And I followed that up by saying, you know, by turning to her and saying, you know, for the record, you've never asked for forgiveness and you've never acknowledge any wrongdoing. And in the same breath that I forgive you and I, you know, kind of send you off from my life, I also ask the court to hand down as stiff a sentence as possible, as I believe is, is fitting under the law. I think that forgiveness does not equal, you know, just kind of pardoning and a slap on the wrist and everyone moves on, you know, happy and wholesome in life. Forgiveness is not a, a, a contradiction to consequence. Forgiveness is about you know, the person who's the victim making the decision that they are ready and willing and able to move on with their life and not get bogged down by that negativity. So, so you learned a lot about forgiveness, but even more than that, you're teaching so many people about forgiveness in, uh, in an amazing way, a lot, such a laudable manner. Thank you. Um, I, I know there's a couple of questioners on the chat. I don't know if you feel comfortable just reading the questions and then responding, but I do want to say that uh, I understood, I understand that, that, that at sentencing, you read a letter that you wrote to yourself when you were a child. Is that something you can read now or you paraphrase? Oh, wow. You are putting me on the spot. I, I told Mendel that, you know, there was not much that you could do to put me on the spot. And I think you, uh, you figured it out. I, yeah, I can, I can find it. And I'll, a lot of the, the, it's available online. It's on, it's on my social media. It's, I think it's on YouTube, actually. For me, a lot of the process, and, and I think that a lot of adults who, who go through that process of, of grappling what happened to them when they were, you know, in their youth, a lot of it is feeling, a lot of the healing process is coming to the place where they can feel once and for all that there was someone there to defend them as a child. I think that when you go through something like this, you feel more than anything that as an eight-year-old, you were alone in the world. And, and more than anybody else in the world outside you didn't protect you, you feel like you almost let yourself down. You feel like you almost disappointed yourself because I know for me personally, you know, moving on from when the abuse started, the, the, the amount of psychological abuse that I subjected myself to, the amount of just of, of self-loathing and, and and so on and so forth was immense, was, was almost far greater than the actual acts of sexual abuse that were going on. And you begin to get into a very complicated relationship with that child who lives still in your own head. And so for me, um, a large part of kind of closing that chapter of, of finishing that whole saga at sentencing was, you know, beyond just forgiving my abuser, was, was coming to terms, was finding some sort of closure with that child with that eight-year-old. Um, yeah, a large part of the trial process for me had, you know, I remember the, my therapist and the prosecutor had urged me to, to keep a picture of myself from around when that whole era started handy. So I could really kind of focus on why I was doing this, what the purpose of all this for was, was really to make amends to that child, as it were. And one of the things the prosecutor did is she, she blew up that picture in, in massive and kept it in the courtroom, you know, on the wall, uh, kind of against her desk in the courtroom. It's, it's, it's very easy for the jury to see an adult victim and, and see me as, you know, a, a grown man and, and think about the situation differently in that sense. And it was important for her to realize that we were speaking about a boy, we were speaking about an eight-year-old and there was a picture of an eight-year-old in the room. And so for me, that's what that letter was. It was it was the ability to turn the page. It was the ability to to close the book and to again, you know, more than anybody else needed to somehow make amends to that boy. I needed to make amends to that boy, and that was the opportunity that I chose to do so. Well, Avrami, well, I have to say, you have been absolutely true to to yourself when you said I can ask you anything, and I really want you to know with the greatest of sensitivities the question. You know, the questions weren't aimed at uh, probing into your story, but it was really aimed into understanding the deep psyche of it all and extracting Absolutely. great wisdom that uh, and experience that, that you've shared with us this evening, which I it just it's tremendous. Um, 
I, I was thinking there's a, there's a couple of questions on the chat that, it, you know, you can read and, and answer, please. And then I, I'm sure you have, I'm sure you have a great conclusion. I want to just, before I get to the questions, I, I think you touched on a, on, a, on a very interesting point of a cancer. And I don't usually tell this story. It doesn't come up, but when I worked on, you know, I came forward in, in the local paper. Uh, one of the things that I had been, you know, one of the ideas that had been pitched to me was if I wanted to come forward on my own terms, I should tell my story on my own terms and let it, instead of it letting, getting it leaked out in court documents, I should find someone who I could trust and I should tell them my story. And so at that time, there was actually a young woman, a member of our young professional community who was working for the local paper and we had a little bit of a relationship. And so I took her into confidence and I told her my story and she was the one who would publish it. And that's where everything kind of went from that moment on. And in the lead up to the story being published, I think we talked for about nine hours on the record, you know, with the tape recorder rolling. Uh, there was a lot to unpack there. And so obviously I had been aware of the fact that if we talked for nine hours, how long was this piece going to be already? She wasn't going to put, you know, nine hours worth of interview footage into an article. And so the night before the story ran the day that I had testified for the first time. So I was going to testify in the preliminary hearing in the morning and the story was going to run in the afternoon. So the night before all this, I was absolutely a wreck. You know, I'm testifying, I'm getting up in open court for the first time the next morning, telling my story in front of a judge and a whole bunch of strangers. And the reporter calls me to fact check her piece. And she had told me that, you know, I didn't have the ability to tell her, you know, print this or don't print this, but she wanted to make sure that the things she was reporting were as I said them to her. And so over the course of the conversation, she, she read probably about 80% of the article to me because, you know, she just wanted to make sure that she had gotten it right. And as she's reading to me the quotes that she had chosen to put into the article, my stomach, which is already in the middle of doing, you know, a gold medal gymnastics routine of its own, is just turning over more. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, I spoke to her for nine hours and she had to put the most revealing mortifying, humiliating, you know, brutal quotes in there. And such, I said, Jillian, you know, I gave you a lot, you know, you couldn't have printed anything a little bit softer. It's really kind of intense. And she says to me, she says, Remy, you know, we talked about this. You're not my editor. You need to trust my journalistic instincts and you got to let me go with what I want to do. And like I said, I wasn't really in a position to, to overrule her. And so I did trust her journalistic instincts. And I have to say, looking back, the feedback that I got after the article and the, and the fellow survivors that reached out to share with me how profoundly it had impacted them, talked about those sentences, talked about those most vulnerable and revealing and, and honest, brutally honest sentiments shared in the article as having been something they related to. That's what they really connected to. And for me, it, it, it reinforced to me that it's, it's not about you know, probing into someone's prurient details because it somehow, you know, helps uh, helps tame our curiosity. When we're honest and we're and we're really honest and we and we share really openly, that's when we have the ability to help people. But when we really, you know, bring that level of vulnerability and authenticity to the table. And so, I appreciate you bringing that up because it's been a very powerful lesson for me. Um, you know, moving through moving through things in life. Uh, did you want me just to read the questions out of the chat? If you're comfortable with that, yeah. Sure. Uh, did you ever consider sharing this with an adult in your school environment? It's an excellent question. I think it's important to know. I didn't go to school, not till eighth grade. I was homeschooled. Uh, there, was no, there was no day school, Jewish day school in Utah back then. Thank God there is now. But I was homeschooled until age 13, until my bar mitzvah. And like my siblings and I like to joke nowadays, we were doing it the, 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 the hardcore old-fashioned way. You know, nowadays, with COVID and everything else, homeschools are a pretty popular option and there is Zoom homeschool and all that. We were actually homeschooled. The five of us went to school at home. And so having that sort of peer support network wasn't, wasn't an option for me. Uh, did you consider, once I left home, once I was a teenager at that point, for me, the, the anxiety around, it, God forbid anybody knowing about it was, was absolutely withhold, made, made me withhold from considering telling anybody. And so, yeah, the answer is no. Did you consider sharing with your parents, siblings? Did you think that they wouldn't believe you? I, uh, I wouldn't say that the issue is that they didn't believe me. I, I, I thought the concern was, was, was actually 180 degrees the opposite. I was concerned they would believe me and I would, get, I would be the one who would get in trouble. And, you know, again, going back to that point of, of the shame and the burden that the victim always carries, for me, I was scared they would believe me. That, for me, that was the greatest concern was that they would somehow find out this was going on and they would react accordingly and, and, and 
the Lord knows what they would do with me in that event. And so for me, not sharing with anybody was not out of concern of not being believed. It was out of concern of, of, of what that would mean for the rest of my life. And so I went to every length possible to make sure that nobody would ever, ever in any form or fashion find out about it. Uh, the last question I think came in when I talked about drowning my, my sorrows in Talmud, how can adults spot the indicators that a boy girl is being hurt? Uh, I'll say this, 70% of children who are abused or neglected in some form or fashion will display some sort of outward symptom. And, and you know, there are some very, very smart people who have written some incredible, incredible materials on what to be on the lookout for in terms of what those warning signs are. And, you know, whether it's sexual abuse or physical abuse or emotional abuse, there, there's, you know, incredible resources out there to be mindful of those behaviors and what those behaviors indicate on a larger level, what those behaviors speak to. At the same time, with that being a reality, I think it's also important to be mindful of the fact that there's not always going to be symptoms. And I think it, it, it being mindful of that is helpful because I think so often we look at this issue from the lens of, you know, we can always prevent this, we can always know what to look for, and that will be enough. And, and, and as I said earlier, and I'll say this again, and I'll say it till I'm blue in the face, a far more effective way of protecting our kids against these sorts of issues is, is not so much to be trained in every possible visible symptom, but is to give them the ability to speak out, to give them the, the, the wherewithal and the tools and the ability to know that they can always speak up about such a topic. And so, yes, there are good symptoms to be aware of. There are important symptoms to be aware of. I think beyond that, it, it really goes to creating an environment where our children feel that comfort and that ability. Kara asks, did the woman ever say anything to you or apologize? Um, no. Um, no. Um, you know, the person who did this to me um, in the initial court proceedings, I think, literally thought a lot of this was a joke. And then when she was given to understand the, the very serious implications of what was going on from a, from a criminal justice perspective, maintained a number of, of different competing theories, which would somehow prove her innocence and and you know the answer is no um, you know to this day um, you know Rabbi Cantor has been asking a lot about sentencing after sentencing after I got up and forgave her and forgave my eight-year-old self and forgave everybody that was seeking forgiveness in that moment she had a chance to address the judge and she asked that she told the judge she didn't understand why any of this was happening and she'd just like to go home to her family and you know this is just a, a grave misunderstanding and 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 that's that and so no, and, and to be honest, I think that's one of the more difficult parts of the situation to, to grasp is that I think a lot of people don't realize how much accountability helps, how much honesty, how far honesty goes. It goes a long way. And for a lot of people, you know, I think that beyond the, the, the jail sentence and all that, all we want is just a little bit of honesty, which some of us get and some of us don't. Uh, in terms of the sentence, um, my abuser was convicted of five first degree felonies. Utah has a somewhat wonky uh, sentencing system uh, and she's currently doing 25 years to life at the Utah State Prison in Draper. Um, was I her only victim? So Chabad of Westport gets to be part of a, of a somewhat of a newer development. Um, usually I've been asked that question every single time I've given this chat, this, 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 this little talk and the answer that I've always given is to date the answer is yes and that's actually changed. As of a month ago another young man came out uh, who had been abused almost exactly at the same time. She was wrapping up working for their family when she started working for ours. And he had obviously read about it, heard about it, and, um, and, and he's come forward as well, which I can't say is terribly surprising. Um, you know, it, th there were many people that had have written about, you know, the fact that, that at times perpetrators will latch onto one victim and make that their token victim. And there are other scholars and wise people on the topic who believe that you know, usually someone who's been doing this so intensely um, is doing it to more than one person. And we now know that to be true. Um, was she in the Chabad community or secular? She was not Jewish. Um, she came very highly recommended. And yeah, she was, she was not, not a member of the Chabad community, uh, not in any way, shape or form. And definitely, I guess secular would be the right word. Can you tell us about support for victims and how it helps your healing process? Um, I'll start from the end. I 
think that anybody who's ever been through something burdensome in life can tell you that the greatest way of alleviating that burden personally is by helping others find a way to alleviate that burden in their own lives. I, I firmly believe that the greatest way that we can bring any sort of healing or happiness or closure to ourselves is by being that role in somebody else's life. And so for me, I've learned very quickly that if I want to be an active player in my own recovery and my own healing, the most effective way for me to do that is to be an active player in somebody else's as well. Um, my, my support for victims is pretty multifaceted at this point. I mean, for me, I'd say the most enjoyable part is having the ability to be in touch one-on-one -on -one with survivors, men, women, the Chabad community, the wider Jewish community, people who are completely outside the Jewish community. For me, it's been an incredible, incredible privilege to be a part of the lives of some incredibly brave young people. Uh, people reach out in, in all sorts of ways, social media, email, you know, whatever it is. I, I try to make myself as out there as possible to be in that role for as many people as possible. And so uh, that, you know, is, is, is a tremendous blessing, a tremendous chos, a tremendous privilege. Uh, beyond that, I, there's a number of different mental health initiatives that I'm very fortunate to be part of uh, in the Chabad community and the wider community. Um, and, and I think, that, you know, raising awareness letting others like me know that there are there are plenty of us out there and, and letting others that haven't been through these experiences know that there are plenty of people struggling out there and it's important to, to give everyone the respect they're due is something which I'm very grateful to count as part of my life. Rami, thank you so much. Um, I don't know, do you have a closing statement that you usually give on one of these? I mean, so much you've said is so empowering and it's so inspiring and you know, I don't know what kind of closing uh, statement would be more powerful than anything else that you've said tonight. But you know, I'll I'll, I'll end with this. I, I I tell people that if there's one thing that I have learned from my experiences, it's that all of us want to lead a productive life. All of us want to lead a fulfilled life. All of us want to lead a life in accordance with what. God wants from us and, and what, you know, the most spiritual entities want from us. And I, I, I too wanted such a life, you know, I, and I had made, as I mentioned earlier, I'd made up my mind at a pretty young age, I was going to be a shliach and I had everything laid out in front of me and it was all going to be perfect. And I think at a, you know, I had the ability to realize that at times the difference in the world that God intends for us to make can more often than not be far more impactful than the difference in the world that we had thought we would make. And at times, all we really need to do is, is, is listen and be attentive to that and, and stay out of the way and allow ourselves to play that role in this world. You know, my life has taken turns that I had never anticipated it would, and it's given me opportunities that I had never anticipated I would ever begin to have. And, and I think that it teaches me on a, on a daily basis, not a day goes by that I don't have the opportunity to dwell on this, that if you want to make a difference in the world in the most profound way possible, be open to the opportunity and to the possibility that the way that God has in mind for you to make a profound difference in this world is far beyond anything that you could have ever imagined. And, and all it takes is having the right attitude and the right mindset and the right faith and the right belief to see that unfold before you and it'll happen. Thank you so much. Really, really right. appreciate it. Good night, everyone. Thank you. This is like the clumsy ending of Zoom. It's like, good night, everyone. <laughs> Boom. But uh, thanks so much, everyone. Thank you so much. Hopefully we'll see you later this week.